Welcome back. Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about Puerto Rican immigration and then later migration uh, to New York City and the United States more generally. It's important to remember throughout this episode that today Puerto Rico is still a colony of the United States. However, they're included on this conversation for two reasons. One is because uh, before the United States colonized Puerto Rico and took it from Spain, there were immigrants from Puerto Rico to the United States, and they're going to be discussed shortly. The second reason is because, uh, like immigrants from all over the world, even though they're doing so as migrants, they are leaving conditions of political persecution, economic suffering, sometimes state-sponsored violence, and they're leaving Puerto Rico, coming to New York City and the United States more generally in search of a better life, which is true for all of the other groups that we've discussed so far. This episode, we got to go way back. Uh, we're going to start in 1850 when the Spanish Empire only had two colonies left in the Western Hemisphere. One of them was Cuba, which we talked about last episode, and the other was Puerto Rico. Um, and at this time, there were a lot of people in Puerto Rico as well as in Cuba who wanted something different, who wanted independence, who wanted to um, choose their own path for their island. In the 1870s, a revolutionary committee of Puerto Rico was formed to advocate for independence, and it was centered in New York City. Uh, a major player in the movement for Puerto Rican independence was Puerto Rican son Eugenio Maria de Hostos, who was born in Puerto Rico in 1839. He was a revolutionary, an educator, an early feminist who advocated for independence and a union with all of the Antilles, and he ends up in New York City, joining both the Puerto Rican independence movement, as well as the Cuban revolutionary movement. Some other folks who were pretty influential in this movement for Puerto Rican independence include Toro Alfonso Schomburg, who left the island of Puerto Rico arriving in New York City in 1891. Again, he was one of these people who was advocating for Puerto Rican independence. Because he had African descent, uh, he became sort of an advocate, and, and some call him sort of the father of black History. Um, he was determined to uplift black and brown stories about the past. Um, he had been told when he was a child as a, in a, a classroom that black folks didn't have history. And he was determined to, to correct this. And Schomburg lives on with us today with the very famous Schomburg Museum and Archive located in Harlem. Early on in the 19th century, what we're seeing here, you have these exiles who are pushing for Puerto Rican independence, and, and they end up in New York City, which, which sort of becomes the center of this revolutionary movement. Around 1,800 Puerto Ricans had immigrated to New York City before the Spanish-American War in 1898. going to relive the Spanish-American War. We talked about that last episode when we talked about Cuba, uh, but Puerto Rico was another colony that the United States uh, acquired during the Spanish-American War. Uh, while there had been a movement that we talked about, both Ostos and Schomburg had been involved in for Puerto Rican independence that uh, predated the Spanish-American War, the volume on that movement wasn't as loud as the Cuban movement. And the United States saw an opportunity to make a colony out of Puerto Rico, and, and that's exactly what they did. U.S. colonization of the island of Puerto Rico was justified by the, the same racist language, the same logic that argued for continued dominance over other countries like Cuba. Uh, the idea that these Puerto Ricans needed U.S. help to sort of uplift themselves culturally and uh, meet the standards of modern civilization. In 1900, with the passage of the Foraker Act, uh, it was made that all U.S. laws applied to Puerto Rico. The U.S. president appointed a governor to Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans could put one person in Congress. That person who is in Congress from Puerto Rico cannot vote in Congress. They're just there. Um, and if we look at sort of the distribution of aid to the island of Puerto Rico when it gets hit with coronavirus, when it gets hit with Hurricane Maria versus uh, the mainland United States, um, we see that the fact that they don't have representation in Congress plays a large role in, in terms of funding, in terms of efforts to help out the island. In 1904, in the Gonzalez versus Williams case, the Supreme Court ruled that Puerto Ricans were not U.S. citizens, but rather non-citizen subjects of the United States. 
Without the rights of citizens, Puerto Ricans became easily exploited by U.S. businessmen, who turned much of the island into a plantation colony, similar to how it existed under Spanish rule, with poor folks still cutting sugarcane for little money. Uh, the education system elevated U.S. values. It emphasized English over Spanish, which was the dominant language on the island. It talked about the virtues of U.S. democracy while denying Puerto Ricans U.S. democracy, right? Uh, this began to change in 1917. What was going on in 1917? World War I was going on in 1917. What do you need to fight a war? You need people to fight a war. And so with the passage of the Jones Act in 1917, all of these Puerto Ricans become citizens. What are citizens eligible for? They're eligible to be drafted. In a kind of conniving way, the United States gives citizenship to Puerto Ricans for the purpose of drafting them into the U.S. military so they could go fight a U.S. war in Europe. However, many Puerto Ricans, you know, they use this newfound citizenship uh, to come to the United States, to New York City specifically. About 5,000 Puerto Ricans were living in New York City in 1920. Despite their citizenship to the United States, they were still forced to live under U.S. rule in Puerto Rico as second-class citizens, right? In Puerto Rico to this day, the minimum wage is not the same. They're not treated the same. They still don't have voting rights. They still don't have a say in the U.S. presidential elections. While discrimination against Puerto Ricans is obviously still going on, between 1898 and 1946, every single appointed governor to the island of Puerto Rico wasn't Puerto Rican. These were Anglo Americans born in the mainland of the United States, not people of Puerto Rican descent. So the United States is forcing Anglo Americans to go rule over these people that we are calling equal citizens who are obviously not equal citizens. So what happens when you treat people and you tell them they can't rule their own country? They oftentimes rebel and this is what happened in Puerto Rico. A nationalist movement gains prominence for Puerto Rican independence during the Great Depression. As a colony of the United States, Puerto Rico was hit extremely hard. Similar to events like Hurricane Maria or coronavirus, Puerto Rico becomes an afterthought. Um, times of economic distress lead to revolution as well. In the 1930s, an independence leader named Pedro Albizu Campos organized an island-wide agricultural strike to improve wages for Puerto Rican workers. Campos was the first Puerto Rican to graduate from Harvard Law School, so he wasn't just some Puerto Rican that could be easily dismissed by U.S. authorities. He had been trained in the U.S. Academy, and all of a sudden he goes home and he becomes this nationalist independence leader. Uh, and, and his strike worked. I mean, it doubled wages for workers, but it raised the ire of the United States, who actually took out one of their Anglo-American appointed governors and put in another one to be stricter to the Puerto Rican people, to make sure that this, this kind of uh, revolutionary movement uh, doesn't gain traction. Campos would remain the head of the nationalist movement in Puerto Rico between 1930 and 1965. Uh, a guy named E. Francis Riggs, he, he comes to manage the finances of the island. And he said of Campos, uh, if Campos, quote, continued to agitate the sugar workers, there would be a war to the death. The independence movement develops even further after World War II. Why would it develop further after World War II? Well, what was the United States doing in World War II? We were fighting the Nazis. What did the Nazis represent? They represented white supremacy, right? We were defining ourselves in opposition to white supremacy. And here we are dominating a foreign group that we have described in the past as being childish, as being barbaric because of their ethnic composition. People in Puerto Rico, 100,000 of whom went and fought in World War II, they, they hear this contradiction. And, and just like the civil rights movement is beginning to, to explode in the 1940s because of kind of the hypocrisy of the United States stance versus the Nazis and then its own white supremacy at home, in Puerto Rico you have a rising. It's not a coincidence then that in 1946 the first Puerto Rican governor is appointed to the island on a permanent basis. And starting in 1948, Puerto Ricans are given the right to vote for their own governors.
however, the FBI was all over Puerto Rico suppressing the independence movement. Uh, they saw this guy Campos and they said, yeah, we'll give you we'll give you some rights. You're allowed to elect your own governor. Uh, but this guy Campos and his nationalist movement, uh, they're terrorists. And, and that's sort of how they were described. U.S. forces and their local Puerto Rican police allies, they cramped down on this national movement. In Ponce, uh, a major city in Puerto Rico, 21 Puerto Ricans are killed for peacefully protesting after Campos is arrested. Uh, he will spend much of the rest of his life in jail starting in 1950 um, because he's seen as a threat to the U.S. authorities. And while they can't really pin him down for committing a crime, uh, he's arrested, he is tortured by U.S. authorities. Um, but the Puerto Rican nationalist movement, it doesn't die. Two Puerto Ricans from New York City, uh, they are so mad about the treatment of Campos and the nationalist movement and the treatment of Puerto Ricans generally that they tried to assassinate President Truman. In 1954, Puerto Ricans tried to assassinate U.S. congressmen, five of whom were wounded. Uh, Campos got blamed for this, uh, despite no evidence. He would spend... Uh, about 27 years in prison for organizing against the United States government. At the same time that this is going on, the United States is trying to reform the Puerto Rican economy to the benefit of U.S. businesses, certainly. The idea was they were going to industrialize the economy. They were going to depend on cheap Puerto Rican labor to work in new factories. Um, this shut out many Puerto Rican businesses, and it undermined a lot of Puerto Ricans' ability to earn a living wage. So what do you do if you're a Puerto Rican, well, you got to find some place else to live, and that's what a lot of them did. Uh, between 1940 and 1960, the Puerto Rican population in New York City went from 61,000 to 613,000. Now, the New York City mayor, he is campaigning for these Puerto Ricans to come to New York, but he's campaigning in sort of messed up reasons. He says these Puerto Ricans can provide cheap labor for U.S. factories. And in many ways they do. Even though they were U.S. citizens and they were born U.S. citizens, they become this next class of immigrant labor, um, forced to work the worst jobs for the worst pay, um, replacing in, in the factories as Italians and Jews and Irish and Chinese move up the economic ladder. Um, Puerto Ricans come in and they take uh, the lowest paying jobs. Um, their migration throughout the city is widespread, but some places that they populated pretty heavily was, of course, Spanish Harlem, which had been Italian Harlem, um, but starting in the 1940s became identified with this new wave of immigrant, largely Puerto Ricans. Uh, they became dominant in the Lower East Side, which used to be Jewish and other uh, low-income immigrant communities. They are replaced by a Puerto Rican population. Uh, the South Bronx and Bushwick uh, also became centers of Puerto Rican culture, uh, as did smaller communities in Williamsburg, East New York, Brownsville, Coney Island, Red Hook, and Sunset Park, as well as some parts of Staten Island. Newly arrived Puerto Ricans, they, they struggled with poverty and discrimination. Not unlike other groups, uh, they faced signs that read, No Dogs, no Puerto Ricans allowed. The poverty and the conditions that these Puerto Ricans faced uh, was overwhelming, as described by Iris Morales in this clip here. Uh, we shouldn't even call it housing. We should call it uh, how they had, uh, the rat holes that our people come to live and die in. Um, we can't call this housing. We just call them dumps. You know, roaches live with you. They don't pay no rent, but you do. You know, your children eat lead poison paint, the, the roof fall on you, and most of the time when you go to the bathroom, you better take an umbrella along with you, because you're about to drop in, in a rainy hangar. The story obviously isn't just one of tragedy, right? I mean, the Puerto Rican community is super strong today, and there's a reason for that. Many Puerto Ricans use the GI Bill after fighting in the Second World War when they go to college. Um, women end up getting jobs in U.S. factories, leading to some social mobility. Making it in the United States, it wasn't just handed to them. It was something that was struggled for. And the vehicle that uh, became the defining struggle for Puerto Ricans was the Young Lords. And this was a group that was inspired by the anti-war movement. 
the Black Power Movement and the Black Panthers, the student strike at Columbia University. Uh, I mean, all of this is going on right at the same time in in the late 1960s. Um, and, and these networks of organizing, of leftist activism, um, of standing up to the power structure. Um, this inspires the Puerto Rican community who forms one of the more radical, one of the more important and significant in terms of change-making organizations of the late 1960s. Uh, they formed a woman's caucus. They formed an LGBT caucus as well, which was pretty radical for the time. Um, the group emerged in New York City's East Harlem and its first major action was to demand garbage service from the city, which they had been ignoring. Uh, Spanish Harlem was a poor neighborhood. You know, we're going to get the garbage of the rich people uh, downtown, but we don't really have to worry about those poor people was sort of the thought process for decision makers at City Hall. But, you know, these young lords, they organized and they demanded service. They demanded to be treated as equal citizens. Uh, a later action is when they, and perhaps their most famous action, is when they took over the Spanish Methodist Church in Spanish Harlem. And, and they created a community, an educational center for the people. Uh, I'm going to allow Juan Gonzalez to explain because he was uh, the Minister of Education for the Young Lords. Because the church is not open at all during the week. And what we ask you for is for space, that's all. We will supply the manpower, we will supply the food for the children. All we ask is for the space of this church and this community. Now we don't think that you people are our enemies. We do think that the reverend who called the policeman, who has had the police here every day since we've been here, and who would not allow us to speak, that that reverend is an enemy, because he does not serve the poor people, and he does not help the poor people in this community. Juan, set the scene for us. We occupied the church for 11 days and established all of these various programs before finally 105 of us were arrested, uh, called in by the, uh, the New York City Police Department. But in the process, the People's Church became sort of a liberated zone. It became an area where we attempted to implement a lot of the social programs that we believed were necessary for the, the Puerto Rican Latino community. And it also became a place of uh, political ferment and many of the the, uh, the people who would later become leaders of the Puerto Rican community were either participants in that occupation or supporters of the occupation. So it became sort of a seminal moment. The main thing that, that we're clear on is that it's such a simple thing to give us space. And now that we've gotten into this church and eaten here and been here for hours, we know what a big place it is. It's incredible, the space in this church. All unused, you know, uh, never open to the community. And it's just incredible to us how such a simple thing like granting a space has resulted in so many heads being busted and so much trouble in East Harlem. And uh, it's amazing to us that people can talk about, you know, uh, Jesus who walked among the poor, the, the poorest and most oppressed, the prostitutes, the, the drug addicts of his time, that these people can claim to be Christians, right? And they've forgotten that it was Jesus who said that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they forget that it was Jesus who said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Uh, and they forget that it was Jesus who said, uh, feed, the, feed the hungry and clothe the poor. And this is what we're after. We're after following uh, the tenets and the spirit of Christianity, not the letter of Christianity, of those Bibles that have perverted Jesus' real revolutionary uh, and, and social consciousness. Well, the the uh, local minister uh, was definitely opposed because he had been, he was actually a Cuban refugee from the Cuban Revolution and therefore had distinct ideas about what social change meant. Uh, but the church hierarchy, the Methodist church hierarchy, eventually <laughs> sided with us, dropped all the charges, and pretty much uh, made peace with the young lords in the years that followed. What the young lords demanded was community control. They wanted freedom for political prisoners, people who were following in the tradition of Campos. They wanted independence for Puerto Rico. They saw the United States as a colonizer. Without, uh, without independence, they thought they would never be free. And if we look at Puerto Rico today, I mean, if you were born in Puerto Rico, you remain a second-class citizen. You don't have voting rights. You don't have the same economic freedoms. You don't have access to aid from the U.S. government when you need it in the same way that other people in the United States do. While not all of their demands were obviously met, 
they did make some fundamental gains, including the development of a bilingual university in New York City, which is known today as Ostos Community College. It is one of eight colleges that formed during this period of uh, radical demands made by leftist groups saying we want to control sort of our education. Uh, Ostos began as, and remains to some degree, a, a bilingual educational institution. It is the only one of those eight that remains today. Just to give you some numbers about today, uh, between 1970 and 1990, Puerto Ricans represented 80% of Latinos in New York City and 12% of the city's total population. While these demographics have shifted some as Puerto Ricans move elsewhere in the country, Puerto Ricans remain a dominant force in the Latino community of New York City. They still represented 8.9% of the city's population in 2010 and 32% of the Latino community. Many of the gains for Latinos are thanks to some of these movements started by Puerto Ricans.